Hey everyone and welcome back to the WoW News and uh, great news, this time it's not going to be another 40 minute monster. I've got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about today though and uh, you know what, it's all actually pretty great I would say. We've got some more lore reveals from the Afterlives Arden wield than I actually thought we would get, so that's exciting. We've got another Ilganoth line coming to pass as well and a whole bunch of cosmetic related stuff and a vital explanation of Torghast for it does seem that many are a little bit confused and uh, to be fair, I totally totally understand getting crossed wires between the terminology of layers, cell blocks, and floors, especially when we're talking about a big infinite tower. All good stuff though. Speaking of which, some good things that we have staffed up ahead of Shadowlands. It has happened. There are now two more in the team, John and Ruri, and uh, through that, we're going to be able to put more time into each video, spend more time researching, more time writing, cover a broader range of things as well. It's uh, actually a really, really big move. I'm, uh, it's hard to communicate to you how excited I am about uh, some future things. And uh, patrons, you're a large part of like making that happen. And on that, it's Warrior Month, where you'll get the Warrior Class pin, as well as, of course, the art. And uh, yes, it is the best way to support us. You get cool stuff in return. And seriously, your support is allowing us to build really exciting stuff for everyone. And uh, trust me, you've not seen the half of it. Okay, let's go. Well, first up, we do have something that's quite exciting. It is our new login screen. Yeah, I mean, uh, that skybox looks so cool that of course they had to use it for Shadowlands. It's great. Now, I will say, a bit of me wouldn't mind a login screen dragon from back in the Wrath of the Lich King days. That would be pretty cool. Uh, but still, this looks great. Also, the new theme sounds great too. I don't think that anybody can say that Shadowlands is lacking in the audio or visual department. The whole thing just looks and sounds incredible, and don't worry, that glowing assessment actually does extend right through to all of the expansion content that I've seen and played thus far. Okay, with a bit of hype done, let's talk about Afterlife's Art and Wield. It's out, and it's great. And sure, you may not have thought immediately that it had the largest lore reveals ever, but uh, I mean, man, it was really, really well done. And you know what? Once you actually dive into it, there is a fair amount to talk about. So, as we see, Ursok was, of course, defeated in the Emerald Nightmare by us. And from then, Afterlife shows him making his way to Ardenweald. Now, that's a bit weird because uh, we saw Ursol and co chilling out in the heart of the Emerald Dream after we completed the Emerald Nightmare raid. So, that is a bit weird. I guess, what, is that them just hanging out for a bit before they get slurped up into the Shadowlands? So, that is a little bit odd. But then that did actually make me think a few things. So, when a wild god on Azeroth dies, it goes back to the Emerald Dream. It's, you know, home realm, just like how when a mortal dies, it goes to the Shadowlands. When a demon dies, it goes to the Twisting Nether. Blizzard have talked about, you know, when a titan dies, where does it go to? All that stuff has been established. So, there is something kind of strange here, though. We thought, right, that the Emerald Dream was the home realm of, uh, of the Wild Gods, okay? That's what we thought for the longest time. That was like core in the WoW lore. But now we see these wild god spirits go to, uh, well, to the dream, and then to Ardenweald, a realm of the Shadowlands. So why do the wild gods, who are beings of a different nature to death, they are beings of life, why do they go to the same place as the mortals? Indeed, when they get there, what happens is they turn into wild seeds, and those wild seeds are then nurtured using anima. But the thing is, anima comes from the souls of mortals who enter Ardenweald. So that's a bit weird. And additionally, the souls that enter Ardenweald, that's usually hunters and druids in life, they're usually turned into a animal of sorts in, uh, in the sort of forests. So anima for mortals is funneled into the wild gods to fuel their rebirth. I, I don't know, like, is that a bit sinister, right? It sounds a bit sinister, a little bit like there's something going on. You know, it like it is said that the Winter Queen is the one who founded, who created Ardenweald, and and the Fawns are I forget their exact um, you know sort of name as a, as a, like a group, but uh, she's clearly the person responsible for like setting up this whole shebang, and that does make you wonder then what is the relationship that she has with the Plane of Life. And for that, I mean, just wait until our upcoming lore video about the Cosmic Spy Network revelation. Uh, that's one that, by the way, the team expansion really helped because we. We just got to spend like double the time in that. And it's got voice acting now. So that's cool. Um, yeah, like the stuff wasn't voice acted. So we we had it VO'd in the office. It was exciting. So that's a, a fun video to look forward to. But um, but seriously, there's all this 
cosmic shenanigans going on. You're like, what's the Winter Queen got to do with the, the plane of life? Why is it that these beings go from the Emerald Dream in the sort of plane of life to uh, Ardenweald in the plane of death and then get refueled, you know, rebirthed using the soul energy of mortals? That's... That's some spooky stuff. I've got to wonder what's up with the Winter Queen. Anyway, so, uh, of course, Ursok dies. His cleansed soul reaches Ardenweald. Now, that cleansing is interesting because it does, like, imply that death can cleanse Void Corruption. And do remember, uh, Void Corruption, like, is what the Emerald Nightmare Corruption actually is. It's like a twisted form of it because um, yogg got his hands on the, uh, like, on the roots of the Northrend World Tree. So, that's what that is. Uh, but still... Uh, as to why he ends up in the dream, uh, like in the dream, alongside with Yazera after the raid, and then he goes to the Shadowlands, we're totally at a loss. And that's the sort of thing where, like, them being there at the end of the raid is significant because Yazera's spirit is seen wandering towards the Void Seed. Of course, that's the Void Seed that later flowered and got bigger in BFA. So, all of that again is a bit strange, a bit mysterious. Anyway, so. Ursok, uh, you know, he turns into a, a wild seed, and that happens, I would say, during Legion, and uh, Aralon, our fey character, is charged with nurturing him up to rebirth. Uh, now, just, of course, that he has a problem, right? The anima drought, caused by the breaking of the machinery of death, causes the forest to slowly die, and from what we understand, that happened very shortly after Yazera died, and we did do a speculation video on that in the past, as to, you know, when exactly the machine of death broke. But, unfortunately... The, like, the forest is dying inside Ursok's uh, grove. And that is very bad news for him. And again, remember, that's anima that comes from the souls of mortals. So, yeah, the mortal soul energy is literally kind of, like, used as fertilizer for wild god rebirth. Uh, Winter Queen, what are you doing? Are you actually an agent of life who, along with the rest of the pantheon of death, actually usurped the jailer, locked him away in the maw, and then started, like, using mortal anima for your own reasons? Is that what you did? Ah, who knows? Maybe I'm just tinfoil hatting. Anyway, it does transpire that the Winter Queen has decided to harvest the remaining anima from the dying groves in the hopes that basically she can double down on the groves that could actually be saved in the now, basically as a plan to not so much save the forest, but at least slow down its death. So, of course, for our protagonist uh, of this short, he has got a pretty uh, nasty call to make, right? Does he sacrifice his grove? It's ultimately the sort of thing where the Winter Queen said she would respect his decision, which I think is an important moment for our uh, like understanding of her as a character. But uh, ultimately, he does agree that she is right and that he does have to sacrifice his grove because if he doesn't, what's going to happen? The whole of Ardenweald is going to go down faster. But sadly, that means that Ursok has to die. He's got to absorb up Ursok's anima and, uh, you know, take it off somewhere else where it can be put to use to save the rest of the forest. And that does mean that Ursok is dead. And I do imagine that is him dying a true death. So, uh, you know what, that's it's a bit of a pity. You know, we sort of met him in Wrath of the Lich King and did all that stuff, and now he's like gone, gone. And of course, with that, our main character then joins the uh, forest-saving wild hunt faction, and uh, that's it for Afterlife's Ardenweald. I would say here, lots of really nice character work, like the production values, the art, the music, exquisite as always for Blizzard stuff. Uh, and certainly, there are a few lore questions to think about that we've identified here. And that is more than I thought when I first watched it. I actually took sitting down for a little bit to, uh, to really have some of these things actually blossom. So, big questions, and uh, let's move on. Next up, let's talk about Turalyon. So, the faction leaders have been updated for Shadowlands, of course, you know, Anduin and Co are uh, sort of off with us in the Maw initially, let's just say. And with that, Rokan now leads in Orgrimmar and Turalyon in Stormwind. And the reason why I bring this up is, uh, of course, Old God related. I mean, come on. <laughs> we, we bring in Old God Whispers whenever we can, but we do now actually have a image to go with the line, The Golden One Claims a Vacant Throne. The crown of light will bring only darkness. Well, I'll give Turalyon one thing. He certainly is golden. He is a walking metal chandelier. And, uh, of course, Anduin is in the Maw with us at the start of Shadowlands. That does mean that the throne upon which Turalyon sits is vacant. So there we go. We've, we fit that. And as for the crown of light, I mean, is that the crown of Stormwind? Is that the crown of light sort of 
referencing, you know, uh, hey, maybe it's the color of his hair. <laughs> maybe it's, you know, just him being a, a man of the light. But, uh, okay, tell you what. Watch um, watch this video, right? It will appear. Watch, this, watch it next. Uh, that's our big video on the light. And uh, all of the breadcrumbs that Blizzard have been, uh, have been dropping, like, literally all over the place about what's going on with light. So I think it's very, very unlikely that anything's really going to happen here during Shadowlands. But I do think almost 100% that this is Blizzard setting up future events. And I'll tell you what, and if you'll really know if you watch that video, um, those future events are uh, events that I am very excited about because they do seem extremely hype. Okay, time to hit you with some game mechanics because we've got Torghast. Now, okay, this is, a, this is a fun one. So I'm partially doing this segment to clear up a bunch of confusion. Uh, layers and floors are different things. So you see this mount, right? That is said to be from layer eight of Torghast. Well, many people think that means floor eight. And then they're kind of thinking, why have Blizzard only done rewards for eight of the 18 floors in Torghast? What's going on? Uh, no, turns out uh, that mount is actually for completing floor 144. That might be confusing to you. So I'm going to put it this way. Layers are actually sets of floors. So in the twisting corridors mode, each layer is 18 floors. And basically the way it works is that each set of 18 floors, each layer as we call it, um, is something that, uh, you know, you, you start and then you end, right? So you can complete layer one and then that's it. You're spat out of Torghast and then you'll be able to go and try layer two if you want. Now, the way it works is that each successive layer is harder than the last. And that means that completing layer eight is the hardest of Torghast, right? That means it's really, really difficult. And, uh, of course, I'm sh I should say here, the 18 floors, that's for the, uh, the endless, uh, is it twisting halls, endless corridors? I think I've just lost my marbles. Uh, it's for, like, the sort of challenge mode, right? We talked about that in yesterday's video. The, the harder sort of mode that's not really tied to, say, uh, you getting your, um, you know, like, your legendary crafting materials. This is the one that's more about the cosmetics and, of course, getting some Stygia, which is a currency we can go into at a later date. Okay, so that's basically how that works. So if you complete layer two, which means that you'll have to complete layer one, which will get you some Stygia, and then uh, you know, that will unlock being able to do layer two, then you complete layer two, that will get you the uh, Death Seeker pet. Then layer four will get you the Helm of the Dominated. That's a toy that turns you into a set of living armor. Looks pretty sweet. Then layer six is the Spire Stalker title, and layer eight is the Corridor Creeper Mount. Now, getting to layer eight will take a lot of time and a lot of effort. Like, seriously. For most people, this is a thing, at least we believe, that, that like most people will be just progressing through over the duration of a patch. Now, we've been working real hard on our Torghast preview. Uh, I, I hesitate to think about the number of hours Matt has actually spent doing Torghast related things over the last like week and a half, maybe two weeks. So we've been putting a lot of work into our Torghast video. It should be up next week. Again, as I mentioned at the top of this video, you know, the team expansions, things like that, it's really helping us do a lot of things a bit more deeply. Uh, so that should be coming up next week. Uh, but suffice to say, it's, uh, you know, it's going in a good direction. Um, but I just thought that, you know, some of the knowledge we sort of use in that video, I should apply to this one just to explain to everybody how like the layers and stuff in the different floors um, actually works. And I guess to tease our Torghast video, I am fully surprised, right? I am honestly completely surprised by how well this feature is coming together so be on the lookout for that one next week the next up a few smaller stories to round us out so new spirit release animations are there and yeah when you release your spirit you get a nice animation and you know what the more the merrier right the cosmetic covenant distinctions uh you know uh, even maybe some light in world utility right they're a great way of emphasizing the nature of the covenant so i think that's really sweet also it can mask loading screens i believe so you know, if, if there's a situation where you're, you know, the graveyard's really far away, it would normally occur a loading screen, what happens? It's going to be smooth and seamless. And that's something that's just important for game feel because it harkens back to one of the things about World of Warcraft that in 2004 was just so mind-bending and really cool to people. And it was just the fact that, yeah, the game had no loading screens. It was totally seamless, which was really cool. So this is a nice bit of functionality. It feels super smooth. And also, it just looked pretty. All right, let's talk about Covenant Armor Sources because, uh, well, we now know how we're going to be getting it, right? And this is the big Covenant sets that people have been excited about and that you can get different tints of. So right now, it seems that you get every single Covenant set, uh, or at least the sort of 
I should put that properly. You get the like initial version of each covenant set from doing your covenants campaign, right? So that's what you're gonna be doing once you once you max out and once you select a covenant, of course. Now, after that, some sources are not listed on the beta for some covenants, but we can basically piece what is there together to get a complete picture. So right now, it seems clear that each covenant will also have a set that is from their renowned vendor with each piece causing or costing anima. So as you get more renown, you'll get access to more of that set. It then also appears that each covenant has got a set from its unique covenant activity. So that's like the Night Fae uh, Garden, the Kyrian Boss Rush, and the Venthyra Party activity, right? So by doing those things, you will be able to get yet another set. And uh, because of that, I would then presume that the Necrolord Abomination Factory will have a set as well. Then finally, there will be, uh, well, okay, so for the Venthyr, they have a set listed that is coming from their zone-wide travel network. Now, each of the other covenants on the uh, beta right now has got a set from a missing source. So we can then assume that uh, those will come from each covenant's respective travel network. Now, the way that all this will work is that Renown Progression and Campaign Unlocks, I believe, are weekly capped, so they will take a decent bit to get. The other ones, though, they'll probably depend a lot more on how much extra work you're going to be putting in to upgrading your Covenant Sanctum. Because, of course, uh, well, at least I would imagine, you know, you're doing upgrades on your, um, you know, your Covenant's uh, unique activity and the travel network, and that's probably going to be stuff you'll need to do to get the associated sets. So... There you go. That's how uh, I believe it works. And I suppose while I've explained that, you've probably seen some nice eye candy. So that's what you're going to be getting in Shadowlands from your Covenant sets. And then to finish it off, time to do some Ripcord Aftercare because it really does seem like we all got rope burned from that video, even though the damn Ripcord wasn't pulled. It was a bit of fun. But I just had a few sort of, you know, thoughts now that all went down. And uh, look, you know, I don't feel defeated about this, right? I am more than happy to take dislikes and a few hits publicly. And um, yeah, you know, I don't really care. I'm more than happy to do that. Um, you know, Preach's video also came out. I was watching his stream when the thing came out and the, like, he was streaming while I think Ian posted the, the post. And, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it was a bit sad. I mean, man seemed a bit defeated and sad, but, uh, God, <laughs> them talking about the rogues on stream was also really funny, but, you know, it's a situation like, you know, me and Preach do actually talk, right? We do know each other. We've been to Preach a few times. Um, by the way, they're all great people over there. And uh, yeah, so this is an issue where, you know, I think both me and him agree. And what I like about that is, you know, he's there in his more top end player focused things. Um, and I'm there in a much more average view where, you know, all, all you people who come into my comments and say it's about 0.1% DPS or 1% DPS. Yeah, I mean, I don't care about 1% or even 2, 3, 4% DPS. I don't care. I'm definitely here for more from an, an average player's view. And uh, I'm more thinking about, you know, what's the button that's the most fun to click? And, uh, you know, has a, like, the button that just has the sort of design that clicks to the content I want to do. That's my perspective in these things. Um, versus any sort of more, uh, you know, balance concern. But that said, as Preach himself will tell you, a lot of the concerns of the more top-end community is just about the fundamental mechanical design of these different things. And to be really clear, because some people still seem to be confused about this, it's not about changing covenants on a whim. You shouldn't be able to do that, I, I don't think. Um, I think a lot of this is, uh, you know, it's about decoupling the mechanical kits from the Covenants. So I think what most people are advocating for is that, yeah, sure, you're a Carrion Paladin, whatever, that's the Covenant you've chosen. But when it comes to, like, the main abilities that you use, that, uh, you know, you can sort of sample from the four abilities that have been added to your class, um, as they would see it, in this new expansion. So there's that. Now, I'd also say the people talking about it not mattering because of balance and thinking that Blizzard will be able to balance it, uh, two things. Number one, they're definitely not aware of Blizzard's recent balance record because it's been really bad with legendaries and you know, a whole bunch of messy legion stuff. It's been uh, really bad through, well, I mean, every single system that BFA has introduced, literally speaking. They're also, I think, not aware that it's not about numbers. It's not about that 0.5% DPS or anything like that. It's about the mechanical compatibility of those spells and kits with gameplay. That's what it's about, and those are different things. So yeah, I mean, I look at those comments like I'll just, I'm just, I'm just gonna be real. There's a whole bunch of opinions being thrown out by non-testers. It's really obvious. Um, but you know, expansions are tested for a reason, and uh, you know, I, I'm happy to get dislikes from people that I don't really think understand the issue. Right? Whenever that happens, it's like. It doesn't mean anything, you know? 
Uh, look, expansions are tested for a reason. I do still believe that Blizzard are very much set, setting sail for a Blizzardy fail. And I say Blizzardy fail because I do think more often than not that everything about WoW is incredible are one thing, and that's systems design. I think systems design has been the number one problem in World of Warcraft for years now. Years, as I go into a lot more animated detail on uh, towards the end of uh, of yesterday's, or not yesterday's, but two days ago, um, as you see this anyway, uh, of that video. And I'm going to put it this way, right? And even if you're, you know, very much disagreeing with me in this particular issue, I just want to say this. While WoW has been reinventing the mechanical wheel for every single expansion through some big new sort of overarching system, while it's been doing that and pretty much going nowhere fast, the likes of Final Fantasy XIV have just been putting out a boatload, an immense boatload of content. They have been outpacing WoW on content really quite tremendously, especially for Final Fantasy XIV. So that's that thing, right? Rough systems that then take design time away from doing content that's, you know, there's a lot of it and it's good. That's not a recipe for success. And I do think the non-competitive thinking WoW players would be best served by straightforward as hell progression with a whole bunch of cosmetic and player expression stuff and just uh, lots of content they can just go about doing. Ultimately, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. I have never really cared about how it's received. I could take a far easier, more PR-friendly path if I wanted to, but I don't. I'm going to do what I do. If Blizzard choose to give me an interview, fine. I'll do the interview, whatever. It's all cool. If they don't, well, fair enough. I can understand that as well. I don't really care about getting an interview or any things like that. And because at the end of the day, you know, I kind of run this because it's like it's us talking about, wow, we're not going to... You know, we're not going to change what we say just to get more up clicks on our videos and likes and things. So, yeah, there you go. Look, I'll tell you what. I do hope the Blizzard get the balance so good that when this expansion actually comes out, people think that rip quarters were just insane dickheads. I hope Blizzard get the balance that right. I mean, there's also the mechanical kit reasons. Let's put that aside for a second. But I will also say I just doubt it based on their historical success rate. So... There you go, that's the situation with that, as well as some tasty, tasty lore and an explainer of Torghast. A feature that, by the way, I'm really bloody excited for. It actually seems like it might be the best thing about this expansion. And uh, seriously, since the most recent beta, the more we play it, the more I see Matt play it, the more we, we just talk about this this video and going over the script, uh, the more that, that happens, the more I'm just, I'm just sitting there getting more and more hype for it. Because, yes, surprisingly enough, even if I'm not particularly pleased about how Covenants are going, I can still choose a Covenant that I want with whatever ability that comes with it and go into Torghast because ultimately, this is another important thing, uh, you know, I'm playing in a guild and uh, that basically saves you from so many problems, assuming that guild is not trying to be, you know, the best in the world where they need to optimize every single little percentage everywhere. I mean, you're not going to be denied from a pug because you're the wrong covenant if you're in a guild. So ultimately, one of the solutions to this problem is just be in a guild. Uh, so I guess on that note, I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think about the various different things. I'll tell you what, right? The Winter Queen, should we trust her? I mean, she seems really nice. It was pretty cool how she respected our boy's opinion in, uh, you know, about what to do with the Grove. But, but, I mean, she kind of does turn mortal soul energy into fertilizer for wild gods. And like, I mean, if you've read the stuff that our really big, you know, video on the Dreadlords doing everything that we've been, we've been doing for a, uh, God, we've been doing that for a good few days now. <laughs> You know, if you know what, what's up there, like, what do you think's going on? I mean, Winter Queen, should we trust her? Is is her seeming really nice? Is, is that a front? I don't know. I'd like to know what you know, though. So that's it. Uh, that's it for that. Warrior class pin, some really sweet art, a sticker to slap on whatever you want to put a cool top hat sticker on. That's what's on Patreon. And as you've seen, Patreon really is incredible for helping us actually grow the team and make more cool stuff for you guys. That is it for me. Thanks for watching today's video. I'll see you next time.